everybody our warmest welcome uh, to this uh, ESG webinar. We are very glad to have uh, so many participants uh, from all over Europe uh, in this uh, hot uh, July afternoon. And uh, we are pretty sure that uh, to the end of this hour, I guess um, that uh, the afternoon will be even hotter because uh, actually the, the uh, topic, uh, the today's topic uh, is uh, an hot topic. And uh, that's a privilege uh, we have uh, to, to participate in this meeting as uh, this is the fourth year that ESG, ESGE offers uh, this opportunity to view high quality presentations uh, on hot endoscopy, endoscopy topics uh, from world leaders uh, in endoscopy and to interact uh, with the speakers uh, and to participate by submitting uh, questions. So uh, please feel free to participate and to ask every question you deem important on this particularly important topic that is a quality issue for upper GI endoscopy. Why it, it is so important, we have a title for this webinar which is really fascinating and promising. So, pay attention to the title from screening to treatment, uh, evolving the upper GI quality toolkit. And I promise you that uh, there will be some uh, breakthrough uh, novelties that, that really are worth uh, for you to be here. We know we have to admit uh, that uh, the quality issue for upper GI endoscopy has been relatively neglected. Uh, Whereas in the same period of time, that is the latest uh, 20 years, uh, uh, considerable improvements uh, in colonoscopy quality have been achieved. But on the other hand, we are all aware that, uh, for example, endoscopic appearance of pre-malignant lesions and early cancers in the esophagus and stomach are not so well known or are poorly known in the Western world. So quality issue that aim uh, to improve uh, the, the diagnostic rate for upper GI endoscopy does require a paradigm shift in Western GE community towards detecting earlier cancer. So, Finally, I would underscore that we are in 2021 and we have to know that endoscopic technology is totally different. We have a high definition endoscopy, we have different instruments for this high definition endoscopy and we will listen to uh, uh, about this. We have enhanced the imaging techniques that make us able to detect subtle abnormalities or even previously invisible abnormalities and more to come soon, for example, with artificial intelligence. So really important matter that is becoming a hotter topic day by day and it, the same will be in the years to come, certainly. We are so fortunate to have uh, with us uh, three brilliant speakers uh, that you all know. Uh, you know, there are some jokes uh, that starts with, uh, there are two Italians and two English and we are in more or less in the same condition. Besides me, there is uh, Dr. Guido Manfredi from Italy. And uh, there is also Dr. Uh, Edward Despot uh, from UK and uh, Dr. Pradeep Bandari that will join us later from UK as well. And this is very intriguing uh, in the special atmosphere of the European soccer championships. And for us, the Italian, waiting to know who will meet uh, at, um, at Wembley on Sunday. So in this special light, pay attention to, to the lectures and ask every question, so either very shortly to the end of every presentation or later on with an altogether debate. Uh, 
Before uh, giving the word, the, 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 the floor to the speakers, I would like really to gratefully acknowledge the collaboration between Fujifilm Film and ESG for this important opportunity to meet and to discuss together about quality in upper GI endoscopy. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first lecture made by Dr. Guido Manfredi, who's a collaborator of mine in the Maggiore Hospital in Crema, Italy. He will present about the pre-neoplastic lesions, make visible the invisible. Good evening to everyone. Let's speak of, uh, about uh, pre-neoplastic lesions. Uh, why bother to follow quality standard in upper GI endoscopy, especially regarding the preneoplastic lesion? Biopsy are, it's not, are not enough. Well, um, it's a common experience for every endoscopy during examination to find this kind of image in which we can see a little bit elevated area. We guess probably intestinal metaplasia, but if we use all quality standard, the same lesion appear in a different way, in which uh, when uh, there is an elevated area, uh, we, can, we can find the typical sign of intestinal metaplasia with biliform appearance and white substance, opaque, opaque substances. But there are some area, yellow and lighted, a little bit different, different for vascularization, and vessels. And it's nice to observe that uh, there is a perfect correspondence between uh, histopathological findings and uh, um, the, the particular area, as in this case, in this part of the, the monitor, in which we can find the coexistence of um, intestinal metaplasia with globed cells and other intestinal specialized cells with um, some area a little bit different corresponding to dysplasia. So the same lesion appear in very different way, but the lesion is the same, the diagnosis is different, is different uh, the treatment, the follow up. So it's very important to follow the quality standard. The real problem is that there are so many quality standards. According to our societies, Quality standards are divided into the pre, during, and post procedure, and they are a lot. And it's difficult to follow all quality standards. So we will speak about the main, the, the most important item in the quality. For example, we have to speak of uh, the pre-examination quality, about the evaluation of the patient before examination, about his fitness, if uh, this patient use uh, medication, anticoagulants in particular, if the, the indications are correct, the stratification of risk of cancer, obviously the fasting, the correct sedation, but I want to speak about the exam preparation. So we, get, we have to get a complete clean the stomach. We know that uh, if we use mucolytic or anti foam agents, we improve our mucosal visualization, as in this picture. In, uh, in our center, we use some water, cemetic on two millimeters, and uh, acetylcysteine just a few minutes before the examination, and we have a good result. Mucosa is clean, and we avoid to wash, rinse, and aspirated fluids. So we avoid to, to touch with the tip of the instrument, or avoid to suck mucosa into the, our channel, and uh, we don't uh, make redness uh, region. So the examination is, uh, is easier, is less confusing. We have a lot of items also during examination. For example, we have to get an adequate mucosal visualization. We don't miss the landmarks. There are so many blind areas, even in the stomach. We have to improve our detection in everywhere, in, in, with every weapon we have, with um, a systematic screen of all the mucosa uh, of the stomach. We have to take uh, our correct time. We have to use high definition endoscope in which we can use 
uh, white light, but also virtual chromendoscopy combined with uh, magnification and take correct biopsies according to uh, signal protocols. There are uh, other, other items also in the post-examination phase, uh, for example, a photo documentation, uh, a correct uh, lesion description. We have to do our final and clear conclusion, indicated the follow-up. We have to do a mm, mm, clear report. But in my opinion, one of the most important elements is, no, is to know the normal gastric mucosa, especially the micro items. I mean, in the stomach, there are actually two kinds of uh, mucosa in the body and in the antrum. In the body, we can recognize if we follow all the um, quality standard, uh, the creep opening as a brownish dot surrounded by a little bit uh, light uh, epithelium surrounded by a honeycomb structure, which is um, the so-called um, subepithelial capillary network. So creep opening surrounded by marginal creep epithelium surrounded by subepithelial capillary network with regular arrangement, distribution, shape, and denseness. There are in the stomach, in the body, also the collecting venules. There are a larger, darker, big vessels. If you cannot see regular arrangement of collecting venules in the body, probably you are facing a chronic infection of helicobacter pylori. In the antrum, uh, the same structure appear with a totally different way. For example, I, I, um, the dominant sign is the ridge epithelium with a superepithelial capillary network with a coil shape. This aspect is due, is due to uh, disposition of glands because in the body, the glands are straight and perpendicular to the surface of the mucosa. In the antrum, the glands are oblique and branching. So the different, uh, the, the, the draw is completely different. As a last summary, I want to show the main item to uh, recognize during our examination, the creep opening, which is uh, oval in the body and groove-like in the antrum. The marginal creep epithelium, which is oval, circular in the body and polygonal in the antrum. And finally, the subepithelial capillary network, which is on a comb in the body and coil shape in the antrum. Every sign different from this draw can be a pathological sign. So it's very important to re recognize the normal anatomy. Speaking about preneoplastic lesion, we have to speak about uh, atrophic uh, mucosa. For example, in this case, we see the antrum with thin, pale mucosa and vessels, subepithelial vessels are mm, clearly visible. So it's a chronic atrophic gastritis. If we use magnification, it's easier because uh, we cannot see any elements of epithelial structure there is a complete loss of round pits. There is a loss of subepithelial capillary network. And there is an arrangement, a regular arrangement of collecting venules. So definitely is atrophic mucosa. This picture is very different from normal trophic mucosa of uh, the, the body using um, acetic acid dyes, chrome endoscopy, in this case LCI, and magnification in which we can recognize very easily the complete normality of the mucosa. Another preneoplastic condition, the intestinal metaplasia. We can also, we can easily find the intestinal metaplasia with white light. The intestinal metaplasia presents itself as a reddish depression or a slightly elevated whitish patches. And sometimes these two aspects can coexist in the same area as in this picture. With chromendoscopy and magnification, um, intestinal metaplasia, it's easier to recognize because we have to think about intestinal metaplasia as a sort of tissue that can absorb lipid droplets. And lipid droplets 
make a white opaque substance that can obscure the subepithelial capillary network. And uh, marginal creep epithelium is like a villiform appearance and seems cloudier compared with non-metaplastic mucosa, as uh, appears very easily in this picture, in which we can find the was with regular distribution or regular and homogeneous distribution and the typical villiform appearance. If we use acetic acid, it's easier because we administrate acetic acid at one, 1.5%, 1 and in one to five minutes, we can see the aceto whitening reaction due to denaturation of superficial protein, and we can see very easily the intestinal metaplasia. It's easier if we combine acetic acid with uh, LCI or BLI, as in this picture, which we can do diagnosis of present or absence of intestinal metaplasia and the distribution of intestinal metaplasia. In this picture, I want to show you the normal uh, antral mucosa with acetic acid, magnification, and chrome endoscopy, in which we can see very easily um, subepithelial capillary network with a coil shape surrounded by marginal creep epithelium with the regular arrangement, shape, caliber, and distribution. It's a completely normal mucosa. But for um, in order to get this kind of picture, we have to use all quality standard with color sedation, uh, clean the stomach with antiform, use spasmolytic agents, and keep calm. <laughs> but if we pay attention during examination, this picture seems very, very different from this area in which we can find intestinal metaplasia due to um, villiform appearance and the walls. So uh, this picture, this lesion is very close to the other um, picture in the same area, two kind of mucosa. So we have to pay attention, take our time and do a correct examination to understand if present prenoplastic lesion and to guide our biopsies. What to do during an upper GI endoscopy? First of all, clean stomach, it's very important. If we, uh, we find a normal mucosa, we can go on with our biopsy according to the Sidney protocol. If we have a suspect of chronic gastritis, we can use chrome endoscopy in order to get a sort of optical histology. And if possible, combine chrome endoscopy with acetic acid to guide our biopsy. In selected cases, we can use also um, intestinal metaplasia uh, for example, to guide our biopsy in some particular region, for example, where there is an intestinal metaplasia with different distribution of the was or villiform appearance seems um, irregular. So it's important to, to get correct uh, mapping of the stomach. If possible, we have to recognize if present uh, helicobacter pylori. All this algorithm permit us, allow us to do a correct diagnosis um, in order to plan a resection, uh, plan a follow-up, or refer a patient to surgery. The very last summary, what we have to do during our examination for planioplastic region. 10 rules. We have evaluated very carefully the patient before starting examination, not during. We have to get a clean stomach. We have to improve our mucosal visualization. It's very important. We have to don't miss um, landmark and pay attention to the blind areas. We have anyway to improve our detection using all our weapons. We have a lot. We have to do a correct uh, photo documentation. We have to take biopsy according to SIM protocol and biopsy uh, on every suspect lesion then we have to um, do a correct description of lesion and indicate the correct follow-up according to MAPS2. About this um, quality standard and many and many other quality standards, if you are interested about this, 
we will speak about uh, um, our third edition of our course is uh, the gaster quality course in edition 2021 and 22 uh, is a course in our hospital in crema in which uh, we will have one day of um, 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 online course a webinar about two hours in which we will speak of theory of um, upper GI endoscopy with all the secret of chrome endoscopy and magnification. We will have time for quizzes, for question, I hope for answer. We have a lot of interesting interactive video section. And uh, on February 2022, we have uh, a live case, cases in uh, our endoscopy room and uh, um, many interactive uh, video section. So thank you for uh, your attention and for every question uh, ask Saskia, please. Thank you, Guido. Excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, I think uh, everybody appreciated, did appreciate uh, the, the, the detail that uh, are required. Uh, we have known that details are really important. There's a burning question. And Edward has already uh, responded live, but I would like you briefly comment on that. If we use mucolytics uh, 20 minutes before gastroscopy as prescribed or the, uh, as you have described, what is the hazard of aspiration and what is the importance? Uh, do you deem important? It's very important because um, to recognize normal structure, uh, we have to pay a lot of attention and mucus can obscure uh, the small signs so we have to, to get a completely stomach. And if we avoid to wash, rinse, aspirate it, we, it's, it's time consuming, but it's not the, the key. The key is that we avoid to make redness region and we have to, to study some, some erosion, some dis, um, suspected dysplastic region, the redness can obscure or make difficult to recognize the small lesion, we have to find that not the can in advanced cancer, we have to find the, um, the minimal change of the mucosa in order to get uh, a early diagnosis of uh, a preneoplastic or dysplastic lesion, because the difference is the prognosis. Is there a risk, a substantial risk in using a 20 milliliter? No. Not Absolutely no, no risk. A uh, very short question. May I know what is the difference between Sydney protocol and the modified Sydney protocol biopsies? We use, uh, we use a Sydney protocol that can uh, uh, assure the 90% of uh, uh, diagnosis of preneoplastic lesion. The, um, the important of uh, Sydney protocol is do a correct position in this plastic in uh, in position in, in region of the stomach. I mean, uh, we have uh, biopsy the lesser curvature, not too far too close to the pylorus because uh, diagnosis there is an over diagnosis of intestinal metaplasia. We have to stay at least uh, three centimeter, and the same on the greater curvature biopsy on the incisura angularis. We have to biopsy in another, um, in another way, anyway, la, the lesser curvature of the body about four centimeter proximal to incisura angularis. And the middle portion of the great curvature, more or less eight centimeter from the cardia. And then we have to, target, we have to do biopsy on target lesion or suspect target lesion. Thank you, Guido. Uh, on this question and uh, on other questions that have been uh, sent uh, to the, today, to, the, to now, uh, we will be back uh, the, during the final debate. Uh, and now it's time to shift uh, to the second presenter of today, Dr. Edward Despot from uh, the Royal Free Hospital in London, UK, that will lecture about uh, transnasal endoscopy revisited in COVID times. Please, Edward. Thank you so much, Elisabetta, and congratulations, Dr. Manfredi, on such a lovely talk. Um, uh, it's really covered everything in great detail. 
a pleasure to watch. So uh, today I shall be speaking uh, to you about transnasal endoscopy. Uh, of course, it's nothing new, but uh, it's been revamped significantly and uh, you'll hear about it and why it's so important in this current time. It really is its prime time at the moment. These are my disclosures. So I'll give you a brief uh, introduction, I'll talk about the evidence base, and then uh, we'll look at transnasal endoscopy in current practice and uh, even listen to some patient feedback. And then we'll look particularly at how it can help us uh, during this uh, horrible time that the world is going through, and then we'll conclude. So introduction, um, uh, it's all about the gag reflex. So this cartoon, uh, this pink shaded area in the cartoon, uh, represents where the glossopharyngeal afferents live. Uh, as you know, the glossopharyngeal afferent uh, fibers are the entry point into the gag reflex. Uh, and these are housed mainly at the back of the throat and also at the root of the tongue. And uh, as you can see, this is the passage of an oral um, uh, endoscope, so peroral gastroscopy. And although uh, gastroscopy is one of the uh, most common procedures that we perform, on a day-to-day -day basis, it still remains one of the most uncomfortable. Why? Because it is using the uh, areas where the glossopharyngeal afferents and hence the gag reflex triggers live uh, as a fulcrum. So you can spray the throat, you can give sedation, patients still find it uncomfortable. And of course, if we give sedation, there are also um, uh, things we have to consider such as recovery, the risks of drugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, transnasal endoscopy was born at the hands of this clever man, uh, Professor Eja Shakir uh, from Wisconsin University. He was studying uh, the aerodigestive dynamics in the context of stroke. And the best way for these to be assessed was, of course, through the nose, because you can look at the larynx and how it moves vis-a-vis uh, -vis the oropharynx. Uh, and in 1994, uh, he went down even further. He did a gastroscopy, a full gastroscopy into the duodenum using a dedicated slim scope. And that's how transnasal was born. And while he was doing that, he realized that his patients were so much more comfortable than the standard gagging that was experienced in the peroral. Why? Because this is the root of approach um, uh, with uh, transnasal. You completely bypass the glossopharyngeal afferents, which live at the root of the tongue. Uh, you're using the floor of the uh, 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 nasal passages, the roof of the maxilla, in order to be able to pass down into the standard fashion. The tongue is free, the patient is able to speak with you, so it's so much more comfortable. And of course, you need a slim scope. Uh, scopes are of the order of about 4.9 to 5.9 millimeter. And uh, even uh, 11 years ago, the uh, respected society the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy was already um, uh, demonstrating that there was uh, equivalence with standard gastroscopy uh, and the instruments uh, were already um, giving extremely good results, let alone now 11 years later with the tremendous advances as you will see, especially made by the Fujifilm scope. So this is the Eluxio scope, which we use in our unit, the latest generation transnasal scope apart from the uh, fantastic CCD, uh, super CCD chip. Um, it's also got a 2.4 millimeter channel. I must say that this is the only transnasal scope to have a 2.4 millimeter channel. And although it's a slight increase from the previous um, uh, two millimeter channel or 2.2 millimeter channel, that very slight increase, as you know from your physics, increases tremendously the ability for uh, the scope to suction. So uh, one of the bugbears or the rate limiting steps before was aspiration of fluid would take a long time, but with the scope, it's tremendously improved. Uh, the uh, bendability or the flexibility of the scope has also improved. So you can take biopsies from hidden areas such as the ones in the cardia. And of course, uh, given the wider uh, channel, it's easier to put down instruments even when you contort it down in D2 or in retroflexion. So tremendous improvements. And you can see the image quality, it speaks for itself. It rivals many of the uh, high definition um, uh, images that are obtained even with standard size instruments, especially by rival companies. So this is really something. Um, it jumps out of the screen. The images are superb. As uh, Dr. Manfredi was mentioning, um, uh, we really like to pre-prepare pre the stomach. And this is our concoction here. We don't use N-acetylcysteine, we use carbocysteine instead, it's brother or its sister, because 
Carbocysteine is very readily available. It's over the counter. People use it to uh, bust mucus and mucolytic um, uh, in, in mucus product producing coughs, uh, and it's freely available. We had a touch of uh, cymeticon drops, and this is our uh, nasal spray, which contains 5% um, uh, lidocaine plus 0.5% phenyl ephrin, called phenylcane spray. Uh, and this not only uh, allows for a reduction in the risk of uh, bleeding, not that epistaxis is a real risk, um, uh, but it does reduce that. Plus, it shrinks down the nasal passages by uh, pushing away any fluid from there, allowing the scope to pass even freely. I would still like to spray the back of the throat with some xylocaine or 10% lignocaine spray, lidocaine spray, because sometimes you get stray uh, glossopharyngeal efferents, which uh, uh, you need to knock out. And of course, lubrication is very important because uh, it's all about comfort. Transnasal endoscopy is about comfort. And this is me having it done on one of uh, my many occasions, having a transnasal. Um, uh, many years ago, I had a bit more hair here, and this is the spray going in, and this is the scope going in. And I tell you, uh, it is a very comfortable experience. Uh, it's nothing to do with uh, what we you do through the mouth. What are the contraindications? Like everything else, um, uh, these are relative more than uh, um, absolute. So uh, history of severe nasal trauma, but this is again relative because if, if you've got a deviated nasal septum, one of the uh, nares is wider, the other one is narrower, so you go through the wider one. And uh, many a time we're still able to do it. Recurrent epistaxis, relative contraindication. Again, the risk is small. Of course, um, uh, if you've got a patient with osler weber Rendu syndrome, you're going to try to avoid that just in case. Um, uh, a bleeding bathysis is, again, uh, relative contraindication. I have done these uh, in patients with an INR within the two to three range, but of course you have to um, uh, have it uh, within the therapeutic if you're going to go down there. And I think the real absolute contraindication is lidocaine allergy, because if you can't put in a local anesthetic, um, you shouldn't do it uh, through nose. Potential complication, the risk is small in our hands, it's negligible, um, but in the literature it's quote to be up to 6%. I think these are the oldest studies. There's of course a risk of sinusitis because you are going through the nose, albeit this is very rare, I'd say less than 1%, and exceedingly rarely dacrocystitis with some bacteria moving up the lacrimal uh, duct, um, uh, extremely rare. I think it's less than one in a thousand. What's the evidence? So um, rather than talking you through each and every study, I'm going to look at this snapshot, this uh, summary um, uh, meter analysis performed by Chris Raganat's group a few years ago from Nottingham, um, uh, and essentially it looked at practically all the studies of relevance, including over 6,600 patients. And um, uh, by far and large, um, transnasal endoscopy was associated with much greater uh, patient satisfaction in terms of diagnostic ability, they were equivalent transnasal versus conventional. And it was the route of insertion, not just the diameter of the scope. Remember what I told you at the beginning, uh, stimulation of the glossopharyngeal afferent. So going through the nose is important. Uh, we had also reflected this uh, in a study I had done uh, many years ago now when I was a fellow at St. Mark's. Uh, and again, patient satisfaction uh, extremely um, uh, good um, and superior, significantly superior, and it was the root of approach, not just the diameter of the instrument. Other parameters, which are also reflected in the meter analysis and also in our study then, uh, biopsy is not significant, even though you've got smaller biopsies, they are still diagnostic. Patient satisfaction increased and no real complications or safety issues. And our colleagues from Adam Brown and the John Pleveris also showed that there are safety implications, especially in patients who are uh, at high risk of cardiovascular stress because they're less stressed, they're less gag, uh, they're, they're not going to be gagging rather. Um, uh, these patients uh, do not put as much uh, pressure on their heart. And again, it is safer and we're avoiding sedation, of course. But flipping back to COVID times, how can it help us? So of course, in COVID times, everyone is worried about aerosols Hence why we use surgical masks, because a surgical mask can truncate aerosol generation at source and protect the environment. And of course, we came up with the idea of a, a surgical mask or a double surgical mask with a slit whereby we can pass the scope through here. We use it through the uh, uh, oral route as well. We put one there and Fujifilm have even come up with a fantastic mouth guard, which incorporates a cover for the face as well. So 
covering the uh, port of, of entry is important to reduce aerosol generation. And this uh, study showed in Japan uh, demonstrated um, uh, this is without the mask and this is with the mask, how much aerosol can hit the environment and the operator if a mask is not used during the actual procedure. Uh, and it was also shown, uh, this is something that's uh, being reviewed for publication by our Nottingham colleagues at Olfo Parablanca, um, uh, transnasal endoscopies associated with at least half the aerosols generated uh, through uh, the mouth endoscopy. So it is um, important. And this is us drawing it through the uh, mask in the height of the uh, first wave of the pandemic. You can see me in full PPE. Uh, and uh, signs of the times really and this is going through the nose so this is the only different bit and uh, it's not rocket science if you're able to go through this bit then you're in familiar territory you're seeing the larynx there you go through just beneath the cricoarytenoids and then you're in familiar territory uh, and uh, this patient highlights the importance of the pre preparatory drink the stomach is really clean and that's important with LCI especially to detect lesions such as this ulcer that was present in the antrum. Of course, it's got benign features, but we've biopsied it, but uh, it, it goes to show how lesions can be picked up and the quality of the images obtained. And you can see me taking biopsies there. But uh, don't take my word for it about um, uh, the uh, patient satisfaction. Let's listen to this patient feedback. This was a very, very anxious patient who would need uh, a GA for endoscopy and having this experience Let's have the volume of endoscopy that heightened my anxieties um, I thought I'd never do it again and then I read up and googled other ways of getting looking into the stomach and transnasal came up um, after reading reviews they said it was a lot more tolerable so I thought well let me try that but I still had the anxieties of the endoscopy which was really bad experience for me um, and actually after having this procedure, it's made me realise that it was all kind of built up in my mind from the previous experience I had, it was a lot more tolerable. Um, I could actually speak, I could actually breathe, I didn't have any gagging at all, a little bit of kind of wind. Um, so I'm actually so much happier that I went this route rather than the endoscopy because I had all these anxieties of not being able to look into my stomach. Um, so yeah, I would. 100% going through that now, I would do it another 10 times. And would you recommend it to patients? To patients? 100%. That uh, it should catch on as a sort of, you know, way I, forward and way I, forward in the UK? Absolutely. I mean, for me, being anxious, if I can do it, anyone can actually do that because I was very tempted to just go back home today <laughs> without even seeing you or going through with anything. So, yeah, I am really pleased and I would recommend it 100%. That's really, really kind. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that speaks for itself. It's a genuine testimony um, uh, from a very anxious patient. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're using transnasal all the time in those patients who would have needed a general anesthetic for uh, upper GI endoscopy. And we're using it in, in our uh, standard uh, transnasal uh, dyspepsia clinic, which basically looks at patients who have dyspeptic symptoms, possibly even alarm symptoms. And that's run by my dear colleague, Regina Raymond, um, uh, in a very efficient and fantastic way uh, at all free a one-stop shop clinic. So how can it help us in the uh, COVID pandemic as such? Um, of course, there's the obvious, no need for sedation means immediate recovery, means um, uh, reducing the need for extensive recovery areas and patient-to-patient uh, -patient contact or patient-to-staff contact. And as you heard also, less aerosol generating, especially if combined with mask use. So there's less aerosols in the environment, a less personnel required because you don't need someone suctioning the mouth. The patient can swallow, the patient can speak. Um, uh, there's no need for intensive monitoring. They've not received any sedation. Uh, and it's ideal, as I said, for the rapid turnaround of a one-stop um, uh, clinic. Uh, and it's fantastic for community endoscopy. In fact, we've spilled out outside our endoscopy unit into uh, an outpatient zone where we can do this in a controlled environment, patient gets a history, goes straight into for a transnasal, possibly gets an ultrasound scan and blood test, and then gets out of the clinic uh, unsedated with a diagnosis and treatment. So really fantastic. It's got non-inferior diagnostics, as you've heard, even biopsy yield, high patient satisfaction, as you've also heard from um, our patients. 
safety because of no sedation. And of course, these all boil down to cost effectiveness and rapid turnaround. And this was also shown in unpublished data from my dear colleague um, uh, Helmut Neumann from Mainz. Uh, in Germany, you must understand that practically all procedures are done with sedation, many a time heavy sedation. And uh, so he had the ability to compare two groups of transnasal, those having sedation and those not. And there was absolutely no significant difference between patient satisfaction. In fact, the transnasal ones were more satisfied because they gained the day without being drowsy. They picked up cancers, so it highlights the importance of not delaying things because of pandemics. And of course, um, uh, patients were so satisfied that they will go for a transnasal again. Recovery, obviously, uh, no recovery time for uh, unsedated uh, transnasal endoscopy and the risk of epistepsis was extremely small. And if you are building a business case, you can also tell your colleagues that you can use it for neonatal or pediatric use, it's fantastic. Um, uh, for complex polypectomy, it can be an added instrument and NJ insertion or even PEG, because if you use the PEG Zac kit, it's, uh, you just need the camera for a gastropexy there. So it's really, really helpful. So in conclusion, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, Professor Boscaini, uh, I hope I have shown you that it is transnasal endoscopy is by far here to stay. I think it's going to take over the norm for diagnostics, reserving the peroral route for what uh, we need to do in terms of zooming in and uh, therapy, et cetera, akin to the ERCP and MRCP analogy. It's non-inferior in terms of its diagnostic ability, including biopsies. Uh, there's no sedation requirement, which equals to rapid recovery and also um, uh, safety. And of course, rapid turnaround, less personnel required, less aerosol generating, high patient satisfaction, and of course, cost effective. And hopefully once this uh, damn pandemic allows us to, we can welcome you again in London. We're hoping to have our International Advanced Endoscopy Masterclass again in uh, 2022. I really thank my dear uh, team and colleagues, especially my good uh, colleague and friend, dear friend Alberto Moreno, who is my doppelganger at all three, and also my Japanese mentor, Professor Hironori Yamamoto, who's always the key guest at our international masterclass. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, uh, for this excellent and uh, really uh, new presentation because it offers uh, as a, really a new perspective. And so we're, we're, uh, while we are waiting uh, anx anxiously, I have to say, for Pradeep, uh, which is uh, who's uh, stuck in a case uh, and apparently will join us uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, we hope, uh, we start uh, a debate uh, with you and uh, Guido about uh, what you have presented because uh, really it's a breakthrough. You are telling us that uh, transnasal endoscopy, even if uh, of course uh, it has uh, a less background uh, uh, on uh, of evidence, uh, a precedent, a literature precedent, uh, totally different uh, from uh, the standard endoscopy. But you are telling us that uh, this is the road for the future. So we have three questions that are, biopsies are still uh, limited as it was for the past. What about interventional endoscopy during transnasal? And what is the new modality? What is the way to apply this new modality? So the right questions to start is, uh, uh, debate, uh, have we to conform to the normality or to uh, it's time for uh, getting a new way to, to change the game, I say. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very kind comments. Uh, very, very kind. And, uh, and also thank you for the questions from the audience. I must say that we've got over 220 participants, which is fantastic uh, for a uh, pre-game um, webinar. So it's amazing. Uh, as regards to the questions, I will answer them for sure. Um, so biopsies, the yield is the same. Uh, it's been shown time and time again. So don't worry about the uh, biopsy yield. Of course, you need to target like anything else if you are after something, but uh, the yield itself is adequate in terms of diagnostics. So that's out of the window. In terms of the evidence, there's a lot of evidence now for transnasal. Um, uh, as you saw, the meta-analysis, there are many studies out there that show um, uh, equivalence um, uh, and the scopes are only getting better. You heard 
from my introduction of the uh, 700 series scope. Uh, it's got a 2.4 millimeter channel, better flexibility, fantastic optics. So uh, incorporating LCI, BLI and everything else. So the same. So yes, um, uh, we cannot sit on, uh, on this pandemic um, allowing delays because delays are going to lead to cancers. Delays are going to lead to delayed um, diagnostics with poor outcomes for patients. So we need to change that. This is a disruptive technology. It's been around for many years, but now it's its prime time. It is a moment where we can rapidly churn through the backlog uh, in the outpatient setting away from the endoscopy unit or an especially bilterian in the endoscopy unit, allowing rapid um, uh, procedures to be done with the same quality with equivalent patient comfort, if not better, without sedation. So it is the perfect time. And if we use it for diagnostics, because this is not for therapeutics, although the Japanese would do therapeutics with it, I think this is a diagnostic tool. So like the analogy I said before, MRCP vis-a-vis -vis ERCP, we use this like the MRCP for the diagnostics. Where we're worried, we shift over to uh, uh, Guido, who will use his special scope with the high definition and zoom, take out his ESD knife for uh, his snare and resect the lesion or interrogate it even further. So this is the way forward, true and true. I'm a firm believer of this. Uh, Guido. Uh, thank you, thank you, Edward. I, I have a question for you. <clears throat> uh, there is some condition in which we had to switch during examination from transnasal to standard endoscope, for example, an alterated anatomy for previous surgery, uh, and deformation of the antrum pylorus or other region, or not? Uh, thank you, very good question. So look, uh, in the past we, possibly had some trepidations, as you say, because of the small chip and uh, the brightness of the scope as well. We wouldn't use it for someone with Barrett's, for example, we wouldn't use it for someone with a history of alcohol use, smoking, they're really high risks. I think that, of course, uh, each case needs to be looked at on its own merits, um, uh, but the definition of the instruments nowadays, with all the things that I've mentioned, especially if combined with good cleansing, like you said, with the uh, brightness of the current scopes, with the suctionability, with the uh, interrogation with LCI, BLI, and anything else. And of course, always having the safety net that if you're not sure, you shift gear and you bring to uh, another list. Then of course, I do not think that there are any bars, especially to altered anatomy. If anything, it's going to help you to get there with altered anatomy rather than hinder you. It's a very slim, highly maneuverable scope with two wheels, not just one. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really, really something. So I encourage any of you who have not used the scope to actually ask Fujifilm to bring a stack over, use it because it really is worth trying uh, and you'll be convinced in an instant. Okay, thank you. But, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, about uh, the, the possibility of using a, a standard gastroscope by this way that is transnasal or is it the, the instrument, uh, the dedicated instrument, uh, more fragile than normal instruments? So questions are regarding the instruments. Okay, so uh, of course you need a, a dedicated uh, scope to pass through the nose. I mean, uh, unless the nose is very wide, you, you need a, a very small scope. So that's why it's 5.9. But the beauty of the, the current technology is that, of course, um, uh, the optics and the brightness and everything else that I've mentioned, especially with LEDs, has um, uh, raised the game. And I tell you, it even rivals standard scope instruments, standard dimension instruments nowadays, really. It's sometimes even better. When I'm doing a transnasal list or Regina's doing a transnasal list and people walk in who are used to other instruments, they say, wow, the quality is unbelievable. So you need a special scope. Of course, um, uh, the uh, narrow um, uh, scope diameter, you, you're going to handle a bronchoscope, possibly with uh, a bit more um, uh, you know, delicacy than you would a standard scope. Of course, you should respect all your scopes, but uh, imagine uh, handling of a bronchoscope. That's, that's a sort of analogy. So they don't break more easily than any standard scopes, if of course you respect them. And um, Andrew, uh... I have a particular question that uh, I know it's very dear to read also because we live in a high incidence area for uh, gastric cancer. And actually after COVID era that uh, as you rightly quoted, 
uh, expose every center in the world uh, to the risk of missed cancer. So we have to reason about uh, to find out uh, the missed cancer during the COVID period. So we have to dedicate a, a great strive to that. Do you consider that the uh, use of transnasal can have an impact on this, uh, that is uh, facilitating uh, workflows? Uh, so increasing the number of examinations, for example, that every center is able to do, even within the limitations inherent to COVID era. Absolutely. I, I'm a firm believer of this, and we have it in action here in London, and not just in my center. I've been, I've been leading on a course with my dear friend Simon Panther from up north um, uh, uh, for many years now. We, we're in our 10th edition. We just held it recently at the Royal Society of Medicine. We do hands-on training and we've also gone hybrid this year. So we had a huge international audience um, just to raise awareness and also to teach how it's done. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's always good to train people, even though it's a very simple technique. Um, uh, and, and I tell you that now the impetus is here, especially in the UK, uh, understanding that uh, with the backlog, we're going to miss things. This is the ideal scenario for transnasal. You can take endoscopy away from the unit to the outpatient center, have a room or two rooms, one where you take the history, one where you do the scope. Um, uh, and, and like that, you are able to do the procedure, especially if you give the pre prepared drink to expose the mucosa, as Guido was saying, in a comfortable setting. If the patient is comfortable, you are going to be much more at ease at looking. This is all about looking. As, as Guido said, it's about quality. So we need to look. We've got a comfortable patient with a clean stomach, a high uh, resolution instrument, and, and the ability to take targeted biopsies, you're going to find that cancer, even with transnasal. And uh, looking at our data, uh, Regina presented this recently, and even our colleagues from Mainz, we are really picking up cancers. She tells me that she picks up a cancer once every every two lists, I think, sometimes once a list. We pick up cancers and early cancers. So if you look, you will find them. Okay. There are a couple of questions again uh, from the technical point of view. The, do the rooms so where we perform this uh, transnasal procedure are different in comparison with normal rooms uh, for endoscopy? For yes, example, uh, negative uh, pressure or other? Look, um, ideally every endoscopy room has a bit of negative pressure nowadays, but we all know the real world does not cater for that. Um, uh, there are many centers which have had to go through an upheaval to change rooms, etc. If you're sensible, if you do it in, in a, the right environment together with your team of engineers who may facilitate the right facilities, it can be done adjacent to your outpatient unit. You need suction, of course. Um, uh, you need uh, the ability to have um, uh, a room to put the equipment, ideally two monitors, uh, less personnel. And I tell you, the setup is really, really easy. Uh, the critical thing is number one, patient comfort. So I need to tie the nose properly, uh, spray the back of the throat as well, give that drink before, as Guido was saying, um, uh, allow time to, to sort of prepare the patient, but you can do this in an efficient way. So uh, once uh, the nurse is taking a history or the doctor's taking a history, they go next door, they pre-prep, they go into the room and you have a sort of daisy chain like that. And that makes it very, very efficient because if you, if you factor in everything and you are realistic, of course, you need to buy the uh, correct number of scopes, I would recommend, to run an efficient service, you need about five to 10 scopes at least, uh, especially if you've got off-site cleaning. Uh, and if you do it in a, in a programmed way, like we do at the Royal Free and other centers in London, it's really, really efficient and really, really good. So yes, we are denting the impact. And I really think that this is the way forward. I see the future is, is a hybrid of transnasal and oral. Is there a disposable uh, nasogastric scope available now? Uh, we, we, um, don't have disposable scopes at the moment, um, although I think that there is a drive for disposable. I think that is a very hot debate in relation to plastic waste, et cetera, et cetera. So I think at the moment um, uh, we, we should stick uh, to the current um, uh, scopes that we have. Um, uh, the ones made by, by Fuji are extremely high definition. And if you are going to have a disposable scope, the worry there is not just plastic, but the definition of the instruments has to be compromised. You, you cannot compromise on quality because then you will go a notch down. And as Guido said, um, having the right optics, the right cleansed mucosa and the 
the ability to look for the subtleties is important. Guido, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. There is a question for you, Guido. The use of yes. aesthetic acid affect the observation of the capillary vessels characteristics, especially to yes. distinguish an early gastric cancer. Yes, it's use, it useful. Uh, I mean, uh, acetic acid improves visualization of uh, diffuse and focal lesion. And there are many patterns of vessels modified into the marginated area with dysplastic uh, cells or heteroplastic cells. We can distinguish uh, many patterns uh, from fine needle network, CoSQ pattern, ILL1 and 2. So um, acetic acid, it's very important, not only for epithelial elements. Okay, so uh, we uh, have two, two, uh, two really defenders, very good defenders uh, for the, the two aspects of endoscopy, the normal one, the old one, the, the traditional, and the novelty that is the transnasal. And I think uh, they presented very well, very well the advantages of uh, each one and how we can combine these two uh, kind of instruments that we do have nowadays into 2021. Is it, Edward? We have I to agree. combine. Yes. I agree entirely, yes. Uh, again, a question for you while I'm waiting for a, from a, the, from David and uh, from the ESG uh, direction uh, about uh, the presentation of uh, Pradeep. Uh, hi. You. Uh, I'm very happy to see you. We <laughs> guess that in this case I had to be really, really difficult to have you stack. Uh, I'm so, so sorry. Uh, I um. I'm glad we're talking about upper GI resection because I started a colonic resection at 10 o'clock. <laughs> My goodness. How did it go? All well? It's all gone well. We removed a 17 centimeter. Apologies to everyone. I'm really sorry about the delay, guys. No, no, no. We fully understand you and we feel privileged to have you to the end of a so difficult and tiring day. So, Professor Pradeep Bandari, that every one of us uh, knows very well, from Queen Alexandra Hospital in Portsmouth, from UK, that will illustrate principles of tissue resection in the upper GI tract, video-based uh, illustration. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad about upper GI because the resection in upper GI is a lot simpler than lower GI. Could I have the control, David, uh, to change? Uh, uh, remote control of the shared screen. Uh, okay. Okay, good. So the, the principles of resection is based on uh, detection. This is a patient with a long segment barracks. Uh, on white light, we can't see anything. But that's where advanced imaging becomes so important. Uh, you see with BLI, so bright because of the LED platform, uh, it is so bright. With this, you see a subtle area of abnormality. I've just drawn around it and I'll uh, magnify this and you'll be able to see that with BLI and magnification, uh, this is definitely neoplastic. You see that there is a clear boundary on the right side, this is neoplastic. Left side, this is normal. So it's all around there. So this is, this is the reason why I say that in upper GI, the whole uh, resection game depends on assessment and detection. Uh, if you have another case, it's a very small circular lesion here. Again, you can see with BLI, uh, it's circumscribed small flat lesion. This is where in barracks, if you have a flat lesion, the principle of resection is EMR. Uh, the whole thing has come in one piece. There's no reason to do any complex resection. That's done. Uh, but when we do EMR, we know anything that is resected in piecemeal in barracks, there is a 2.5 fold increased risk of recurrence. Uh, and that's the reason why other techniques have been developed 
And back in 2017, we published our Portsmouth protocol, which we've been following for 10 years now. Uh, and our vision is that if you have invisible dysplasia, you go straight for RFA, but you need to confirm it at least twice. If you have a visible flat lesion, as I showed you in the last two videos, you go for EMR. If you have a visible nodule, 1S or 2C, then you go for ESD. That's the principle of neoplasia resection in Barrett's. Uh, excuse me. So uh, if you look at these uh, lesions now, they are very big nodules uh, in both these patients with Barrett's. Uh, big nodules uh, looks very suspicious. Look at these tumor vessels on BLI. Uh, and these kind of lesions cannot be resected by EMR. That will be very, very inappropriate because this is obviously a cancer and needs to be resected in an end block fashion. So, ESD is the only technique which meets the oncosurgery principles. When you suspect it's cancer, you should resect it in an end block fashion. You can see here, it's completely isolated from the normal mucosa. Uh, and finally, both of these lesions resected in a single piece in an end block fashion. Both of them came back as SM1 <coughs> invasion and I think my next slide should show, but this is one of the largest Barrett's ESD series published because there is a lot of talk and chatter about the fact that ESD in esophagus is not safe in Western hands. So this is our multicenter uh, Barrett's ESD study where we looked at 142 patients who underwent ESD. You can see nobody had perforation. Two patients had delayed bleed and three patients developed stricture uh, after ESD and RFA. So it's very safe and is the best technique for resecting lesions where you suspect cancer. Uh, now the data is developing very fast, which suggests that if it's an SM1 good prognostic cancer in Barrett's, then the risk of lymph node metastasis is very low and there is no need to subject them to surgery. They can be cured by ESD. How about squamous? This is a completely different game. Look at this. It's a very, very nasty looking lesion, almost circumferential, uh, measures about 10 centimeter in length. Uh, you can see different type of IPCL patterns in different areas. This is where the BLI, the magnification and Alexio platform becomes so useful to assess all these vessel patterns and understand. Now this patient, to us on assessment showed areas of concern suggesting SM invasion, but the patient wasn't fit for surgery. Had a 10 centimeter lesion, again, not fit for chemoradiotherapy either because it's a massive lesion to give radiotherapy in such a large area was not, and he had renal failure. So we decided to go ahead with ESD. Now with BLI, and magnification, the role for these other dye sprays has become minimal, but in Lugol still remains a very, very good technique to identify the borders. You see, we can identify, it's almost circumferential, but not fully circumferential. So what we do in this case is, I've done the resection at the stomach side first. So we inject it on the far side of the lesion, lifted the mucosa and cut on the stomach side. Uh, this is the incision, mucosal incision on the stomach side. Then we come back up on the oral side. And then we, uh, there we go. This is the oral side. And we make a nice big flap. We start the incision, uh, dissection, make a nice big flap. This is where injection with a knife, like a flush knife, becomes very important. What we're doing now is attaching a clip and uh, um, uh, dental floss to produce traction because this is a massive lesion. Uh, it is almost circumferential. So we decided we're going to do a circumferential excision, although that was not the intention to start with. So we go ahead uh, with the traction. Once we have traction, you'll see the planes open up so well. Look at that. So I'm just going under it 
all this dissected so well, nice submucosal plane opens up. I've switched my knife now because I'm doing blind dissection. See, you're pulling back. This is not the type of dissection you should be doing with uh, a needle type knife. Here you can see the entire lesion has been resected circumferentially. You know very well now, the patient's having circumferential uh, 10 centimeter resection in the esophagus at very high risk of getting strictures. So what we did is uh, straight away put a 15 centimeter stent uh, across this entire lesion. You see the stent there? Uh, and then we fixed it with a stent fixation clip. This is over the scope stent fixation clip because otherwise the stent will just slip. Uh, the patient is actually coming back tomorrow to have this stent removed. Uh, and there is a special cutter that we use by which we can cut uh, uh, this stand removal, the stand fixation clip and remove the stand. You can see there a nicely placed. Hopefully there shouldn't be a stricture tomorrow when we remove it. So in squamous neoplasia, curative resection can only be achieved in patients up to M2. If you have M3 and SM1, that's considered borderline and our patient was borderline but there was no other option available for him. Although SM1 data here shows 13 to 19%, but if it is a well differentiated without lymphovascular invasion, then the risk of invasion is much, much lower than that. So that's why we consider that this is the best treatment for the patient, but be very, very careful in squamous. This is the reason why we never do EMR in squamous. Finally, gastric, again, technology for identification and uh, detection of lesion, LCI, look at that. When you have LCI, it shows red on pink, which is how you detect early gastric cancer. Uh, very, very useful to use technology like that. This is just uh, 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 another large gastric cancer, very close to the uh, pylorus. We marked using uh, LCI and we use the tunneling technique this is from the oral side, and there you can see the tunnel all the way through. So we opened up all the way through, and this is one of the new ways of doing ESD is to create tunnels and pockets, and there you go, the entire lesion has come off. Again, in stomach, uh, unless the lesion is less than 10 centimeter, there's no role for EMR, it's always ESD. Uh, you can see these are the patients who can achieve complete curative resection uh, with ESD in stomach. Uh, Intraprocedural bleed during ESD is very common. You need to be very careful. Uh, here you can see you can use cock graspers, bipolar forceps, but we use this hemostatic gel called Purostat. You can see right in front of you, this is real time without editing. Within a few seconds, the bleed has stopped. And then you gently back off. Uh, you just back off. You can see the gel has covered it. The bleeding has stopped. We just put a little bit extra and then we go and dissect in some other area, come back to the same space again in about five, 10 minutes, flush off and we can continue to dissect. Duodenal EMR is a a very, very, I call it a tiger territory, mainly because of the risk of perforation and risk of bleeding. The risk of delayed bleeding is almost 30%. Perforation rate here is around five to 10%. So be very, very careful. Most of the time here, we would be doing EMR. You can see here, I've just cut the edges of this lesion with the tip of the snare so that my snare can engage very well. And then we resect it with the snare. Uh, you see uh, almost the entire lesion has come in our snare in one single bite because we did a mucosal incision all the way around it. And there the lesion is off. Uh, because these patients, this is another patient with recurrence following a duodenal EMR. So we again did a combination of hot and cold resection here. And then we know that the risk of delayed bleed is very high. So again, we apply Purostat and in our hands, it works very well. Look at that, I'm using gravity to my advantage, allowing Purostat to gravitate everywhere, cover all the base of the resection and come out. 
And that's where uh, we found that the delayed bleed rate goes down substantially after using Purostat after resection. So in conclusion, I think lesion assessment will help you decide the best management pathway, whether it's EMR or ESD or surgery. If it's Barrett's uh, flat lesion in Barrett's or duodenal adenomas, EMR is the treatment of choice. If it is squamous cancer or gastric cancer or nodular lesion in Barrett's, ESD is the treatment of choice. Be very, very careful about bleeding. We can coagulate most of the vessels in the stomach, but in duodenum and esophagus, be very careful. I don't coagulate vessels in the base there. We use Purostat because in our hands, that has substantially reduced the risk of delayed bleed. I'll stop there, happy to take any questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pradeep, uh, for this excellent, outstanding lecture, straightforward to the target. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we have finished the time a lot of this, so we have to conclude the, 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 the webinar, I guess, uh, with uh, the complaint of the so many participants that have endured uh, till now. But you know, we are in soccer time, and so we have <laughs> to be strict. No, extremely, extremely grateful for this effort uh, after your day. So, we are to the moment of thanking for this uh, extremely useful initiative, Fujifilm, certainly, ESGE govern governing board for this uh, uh, webinar more. And uh, I invite all of you to attend the next one. And of course, the webinar team, David Inker and Gabriela Varga for their, their precious uh, assistance. I think that uh, all of you are really uh, satisfied for the information you have uh, all received uh, today. And the very large and lively participation uh, testifies to the interest of the GE community in the topic of quality endoscopy. So see you to the next uh, ESG webinar and enjoy the soccer match, of course. Uh, we will all do so as well. Thank you. I was just going to say, guys, next webinar from ESG is on diversity and equity. That's a subject very close to my heart. So if you have any questions, suggestions, I would really encourage everybody to join the discussion. This will next webinar is all about discussion and getting people's thoughts about diversity and equity in endoscopy. So hope to see you then. And please wish England good luck for tonight. The same as for Italy. <laughs> See you. Bye. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye bye. 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 Take care. Bye.